Hello, I am Josh Gothier with Local Writers Read, a literary series featuring Maine writers. Um, I am here with my co-organizer, Claire Guyton, for another genre spotlight with LA Arts. Uh, so I will turn it over to Claire to introduce our genre and our readers today. Thank you. The genre we're spotlighting in this last 2020 virtual art walk is horror. Our listeners need no introduction to horror fiction, given that Maine is the home of Stephen King. Some might be like me, however, and have no idea about the wide variety of horror subgenres, which include, to name just a handful, gothic, dark fantasy, paranormal, psychological, post-apocalyptic, and even comedy horror. Now, before we get to our readings, I'll ask my usual question. What draws you to write in this genre? Renee, why don't we start with you? Well, I like to face my fears, and I think it's important that everybody faces their fears. I, I more think that horror chose me, so everything I write turns dark. Yeah. Um, all right, thank you. And so I, without further ado, Renee, do you want to kick us off with our actual readings? Sure. Um, today I'm sharing with you from my novella in progress titled Chisel the Bone. It's a sequel to my debut novella, The Bone Cutters. Here we go. This is Chisel the Bone, and the title of this section is The Carver, The Collector, and The Stitcher. A cloth is secured in his mouth. It's knotted tight to keep him from screaming. A blindfold stretches across his eyes. The white hot sting of the blade slicing through the skin of his shin makes him grit his teeth. Only a whimper escapes. Buck knife in hand, the carver gets down to the bone quickly. Twin serpent-like scars run up the outside of both of the carver's forearms. They writhe and pulse as he reaches out and swaps the knife for a chisel and mallet. Like a modern day Michelangelo, he begins whittling away at the victim's tibia, the bigger of the two shin bones. Serpent scars slither around while he works. Every hit of the mallet sends a shaking jolt through the restrained man. The chair legs rattle against the towel floor with every jostle. His ankles are zip tied to the wooden chair legs. His wrists are zip tied to each side of the back of the chair. Tears soak the blindfold and leak down his cheeks from underneath. Snot bubbles at his nostrils. Strands of his shaggy brown hair stick to his sweaty temples. Rather than creating a work of art, the carver extracts bone shavings. With the help of the collector, who is beside him, curls of shaved bone are caught under a sheet of tin foil. These ribbons of victory will get crushed to dust at a later time. From behind the carver, someone with gnarly scarred knuckles passes the collector a second sheet of tin foil. The filled foil is switched with the empty. The carver reaches for a new tool. The chisel and mallet are swapped with a small utility knife. Rapid shaving motion slide down the tibia over and over and over again. More whimpering, more chair rattling. Sibling serpents shake and slither along with every movement of the carver's arms. Bone dust is collected this time. The second batch is for immediate consumption. Mixed with blood, the dust looks like sticky black tar heroin. Bone cutters call it dark heaven or red sugar or simply dust. Deal done, the stitcher steps out of the shadows, thread and needle held in grotesquely scarred hands to seal the wound. The victim is no longer whimpering. The victim is no longer crying. The victim is now passed out, head hung low, chin to chest. Whether from shock or blood loss is of no concern to the carver, the collector, or the stitcher. All they're here for is the dust and the high that will come with it, as well as the money they'll make off what they don't smoke or snort or inject themselves. The stitcher is thankful, not just for the high to come and the money they'll make, it sure is easier to stitch the wound without all that shaking and blubbering that was going on a few moments ago. The needle and thread zips back and forth through the flesh as smoothly as a whisper floating with the wind. Wound now sealed shut, it's time to clear the scene. With two tips of the chair by the collector and the stitcher, the carver carefully slides out the blood-covered plastic tarp that is spread out underneath the victim and the chair. He rolls it up, preps it for disposal. Then the zip ties are snipped from the victim's wrists and ankles and tucked securely into the tarp. Add in a few rocks in the park and the walk back to their den and these bone cutters will send all remnants of this event downriver. All except the product and the buck knife. The hilt of the knife is wiped clean. Then it's placed in the victim's hand with his fingers wrapped around it, assuring only his prints are found. The carver, the collector, 
and the stitcher are good at covering their tracks, maybe not the tracks in their skin or the scars that double as their own living entities, those they wear with pride, like badges of honor, but definitely the tracks from the assaults against all their unwilling victims. Not all victims are unwilling. Some enjoy the rush of the slice, like a bite from a vampire. The donors, minions or lackeys if you're a non-dust user. Some might call them Renfields. Many bone cutters, aka dusters, also get a rush from the slice, but it sure does wear you down after a while. All that blood loss, all that pain. It's much more satisfying and stimulating to inflict that pain on another. But when times get desperate, they will again slice into themselves. Seen all clean and sparkling as though only the victim has been present, the three junkie cutters vacate the premises. The tarp is rolled up tight and worn like a backpack by the collector. After one last wipe of the outside doorknob, the three practically skip down the hallway and out onto the sidewalk, as giddy as children approaching an ice cream truck. While strolling away from the scene of the crime, as though nothing unusual has taken place, they hear the flutter of large wings overhead. The sound is moving towards the house they've just left behind. They all look up, wondering if it's what they think it is. A glimpse of huge black wings zooming past the beam shining from the streetlight is confirmation. Thank you, Renee. I'm gonna read from my short story collection, Dark Blood Comes From The Feet. Crab. Audrey, I'm going to see what he's up to. Jim looked down at his wife. Nose buried in a book as she spread her legs out to Tam, she didn't acknowledge his existence. Jim hated the beach. He hated the sun and the suntan cream and the sand. They all seemed to conspire to make him uncomfortable, hot, sticky and itchy. It didn't help that Audrey adored the seaside. He looked at her blotchy legs, greasy with lotion, the small pale brown freckles on her knees that he used to find endearing. The red skin on her thighs looked tight and ready to burst like overcooked sausages. One of those true crime books she always seemed to be reading lay on her lap and as his gaze traveled up her torso, he was confronted by her cleavage, her massive breasts barely restrained by flowered spandex. On her head was a ridiculous floppy sun hat, a relic from the seventies, just like the two of them. You're in my son, Jim, she said. Jim went to sit back down again thought better of it and straightened him back up. He looked down the beach. His nine-year-old son was keeping himself busy with something near the water's edge. Jim lumbered over to James, named after him, his feet toiling against the dry sand, burning his soles. His son was crouched over something on the sand. Jim stood at a distance at first, watching as James waggled a stick in his hand. Even from behind, the boy had that look of concentration. It bothered Jim to see him so still. It never indicated anything good in Jim's opinion. His son's hunched back looked small, his body thin and pale, looking blue in parts, his skin almost translucent, ribs poking out like a baby bird's. He looked younger than he was. What you up to, James? Jim was aware of the fake cheerful quality that affected his voice every time he had to try to have a reasonable conversation with his son. It sounded squeaky, his throat tightening as if it was swelling in the heat. He coughed to try and deepen his tone. Usually Jim was proud of his voice. It was deep and resonant, if he did say so himself. He'd read something about stress tightening your vocal cords, making you screech. Perhaps that was what was happening. He needed to relax. Why would interacting with his son make him so anxious? He asked again. What are you doing, James? Nothing. James didn't turn round. His voice was high, even for a kid. Maybe he was nervous too. Some specific quality of James' voice irritated Jim for no reason he could pinpoint. Doesn't look like nothing. James didn't answer, so Jim walked closer. What you got there? It was the smell that hit Jim first. The smell of decay and salt and sea. Roadkill smell, almost skunk, but not quite. Before James, like a tribute, was the corpse of a horseshoe crab, half hollowed out and rotting. James grinned to himself and dropped his stick. He didn't seem to notice the smell. The corpse was about a foot and a half long to the end of its tail spike, and its body was the size of a small skillet. It was bulbous, shiny, a mosaic of military green and brown. The sand on it looked like frosting. 
Jim watched, horrified, as James bent down and picked it up, turning it over in his hands, the spindly legs moving like articulated puppet fingers. James didn't look up at his father. He continued to run his fingers over the shell, then held a leg between his thumb and finger, working the joints. Dropping the leg, he picked up the next, worked its joints back and forth, repeated the action over and over, mm. methodically, mechanically. Jim opened his mouth to say something, to tell James to drop it like you would a dog that's got something in its mouth it shouldn't have, but no noise came out. His mouth flat open and shut. The remains of the hot dog he had eaten earlier crawling its way back up his throat. He gagged, choking on it, acid burning his gullet. James looked up at him, squinting in the sun, and held the horseshoe crab corpse up to him like he was presenting a prize. Jim could have sworn, no, it must have been the sun, heat stroke, but he could have sworn that the crab began to move of its own volition. Impossible. He took a few steps back, vomited in the sand, and looked at it again. That thing was moving. It was moving in James's hands, and Jim's nostrils were filled with the stink of its death rot, and this could not be happening. Did he have food poisoning? Was he hallucinating? He heard the dry click of those legs moving on their own. Jim looked at his son. There was something sly in that little bastard's face. Jim shuddered and ran up the beach to Audrey, stumbling desperately in the burning sand. Thank you both so much. Uh, that was fantastic. Before we say our goodbyes, I'd love for you both to recommend a favorite horror author or work. Uh, we'll start with you again, Renee. Um, I'd say, yeah, Stephen Graham Jones is really great. Um, I just read his, uh, one of his new releases, uh, The Only Good Indian, uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, The Only Good Indians. It's excellent. I would second that and also um, Shirley Jackson. I think that um, We Have Always Lived in the Castle is the perfect novel. All right, um, thank you both. That wraps us up for today. Um, thank you very much to LA Arts for giving us the opportunity to do all these genre spotlights. Um, moving forward, be sure to stay in touch with LA Arts and Local Writers Read on social media. Um, there's much more writing to come. Um, and thank you to Emma and Renee for sharing your work with us today. Uh, so be sure to check out all the other creators this weekend and thanks for listening.